Hello, I'm Graham Stott from Lexis PSL Private Client. We've seen several cases recently involving disputes between beneficiaries and trustees. Trustees are coming under increasing pressure as to how they exercise their discretion and manage the investments of the trust fund, often leading to allegations of misconduct from beneficiaries. Beneficiaries want transparency and the ability to hold trustees to account and, if necessary, to be able to affect the removal of trustees. I'm joined today by Peter Steen, a partner in Mishkondorea, to discuss these issues. Peter, what are the main challenges facing trustees? Well, thanks, Graham. One of the main uh, challenges currently facing trustees is the increased focus on transparency, as you mentioned. And that focus manifests itself in several ways. One is in terms of the increased level of regulation on trustees. Increased regulation is in many respects a good thing because it leads to better standards in the trust industry, but equally uh, it uh, constitutes a, a significant uh, cost burden for trustees as well. Um, another uh, way that the, that the focus of, on transparency manifests itself is in terms of the, uh, the beneficiaries' expectations of, uh, inter uh, of accountability and holding trustees to account. Uh, we've seen a spate of cases recently in which beneficiaries have uh, asked trustees for widespread uh, information. Um, and another, uh, another way this, uh, this focus on accountability manifests itself is, as you say, in, in terms of the number of applications to remove uh, trustees from office. The court has an inherent jurisdiction to remove uh, trustees. The, the key case is a, in, in this regard is a 19th century case, Letterstedt and Brewers. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the guiding principle, according to the Privy Council in that case, is the welfare of the beneficiaries. Um, friction and hostility between a trustee and a beneficiary is a relevant factor, but it won't be um, the determining factor. Uh, in a subsequent uh, case, re writes in the court held that where the, um, the trust property is, is unlikely to be safe or where the administration of the trust is likely to be in jeopardy, those are also relevant factors too. So if a, tr if a beneficiary wanted to remove a trustee, how would you advise they do that? Well, the first thing to do is uh, look at the terms of the trust instrument. Most trust instruments, particularly in the offshore world, uh, will contain uh, an express power of removal. Uh, the power of removal might be reserved to the settlor, or might be reserved to a protector. It depends on the circumstances. Uh, the power of removal is a fiduciary power, which means it must be exercised in the interest of the beneficiaries uh, as a whole, as opposed to in the interest of the power holder. Um, most, ju most jurisdictions also have statutory provisions relating to the removal of trustees. In England, for example, under Section 36 of the Trustee Act 1925, there are provisions uh, enabling the court to remove trustees in certain circumstances. They include, for example, where the trustee has been overseas for at least 12 months or where the trustee is uh, unfit to act as a, as a trustee or, or incapable of acting as a trustee. That Section 36 power uh, is vested in the person named in the trust instrument as having the power to appoint a new trustee. Uh, if there's no such power in the trust instrument, then it's vested in the continuing trustees. Uh, Section 41 of the Trustee Act 1925 is another uh, relevant provision that enables the court to uh, appoint a, a new trustee in substitution uh, to an old trustee where it considers it expedient to do so. But presumably applications to the court for the removal of a trustee are expensive. Who is responsible for paying the costs of that application? Well you're absolutely right, they can be very expensive and uh, significant legal costs can be incurred. The court has a wide discretion uh, in terms of uh, who it orders to pay the costs of the application. Uh, the, uh, in, in the letter Stett and Brewer's case that I mentioned earlier, um, Lord Blackburn said that in, uh, where there's been a breakdown between trustee and beneficiary, the trustee is always advised by his own counsel to resign. So if there is an application to remove the trustee and the trustee has failed to resign in circumstances where it ought, he or she or it ought to have done, then the like, in all likelihood the court will order that the trustee 
pay the cost of the application. And by that I mean that the trustee, the, tr the trustee will have to pay the cost out of his or her own pocket as opposed to from the trust fund. Uh, in those circumstances there are often co-trustees involved uh, where the co-trustee isn't bringing the application the co-trustee will normally be expected to take a neutral stance in the application uh, if, it, if it does take a neutral stance in all likelihood the uh, the court will order that its costs or his or her costs can come from the trust fund uh, similar um, rules apply in, in, in the context of the, uh, the removal of personal representatives as well. And there was an interesting case in 2015, Jones and Longley, uh, in which a Mr. Jones uh, sought the removal of his co-executor, Mr. Longley. Um, and in the event, the court actually uh, ordered that Mr. Jones should cease to be executor and Mr. Longley should remain as executor. But it found that Mr. Jones had been right to bring the application. Mr. Longley had been wrong to resist the application. So Mr. Jones uh, was uh, ordered to, to, he was allowed to have his costs, his costs were payable by Mr. Longley, and Mr. Longley was prevented from having his costs out of the estate. So considering this new era of accountability, should trustees be more worried about making mistakes? Well, everyone makes mistakes, including trustees. Um, they have done historically, and they will do in the future. Uh, there are various options available to trustees where mistakes are made. If the mistake relates to a written instrument, the trustee may be able to rely on the remedy of rectification to rectify the mistake. Um, under the doctrine of equitable mistake, the trustee may be able to um, unwind a transaction if it's ma mistakenly made and it would be unconscionable for the person benefiting from the transaction to rely on, on the mistake. Uh, I think it's right to say that the courts are becoming less tolerant of trustees making mistakes. Uh, in the Supreme Court case, uh, Pitt and Holt and Futter and Futter, uh, the Supreme Court uh, effectively overturned the long-standing rule in Hastings Bath. That rule effectively provided that uh, where trustees have a discretion and the, they exercise that discretion but the effect of doing so is different from what they were expecting, the court may interfere uh, if the trustee has uh, either relied on irrelevant considerations in the, excess, in the exercise of its discretion or um, failed to take into account uh, relevant considerations. Uh, so uh, so that, that rule no longer applies. Interestingly, however, some jurisdictions have legislated uh, to reintroduce that rule. So Bermuda is one example, Jersey is another example, and it will be interesting to see uh, whether other jurisdictions do so in the future. Peter, thank you. So, trustees beware. A lot is expected from modern day beneficiaries, particularly of professional trustees who are expected to discharge their appointments to a high standard. Beneficiaries and the courts are becoming more intolerant of mistakes made by trustees. And applications to the court to set aside transactions made by trustees in error or for the removal of a trustee are costly, with those costs often being ordered to be paid by the trustees personally. Thank you for joining us.